All right, good morning, Illuminate. Hey, listen, before we get into our text today, I wanna bring you a uh, quick something that I do every election season at about this time. I encourage Christians everywhere to get out and exercise their right to vote. And the reason why, well, there's a number of reasons why, not the least of which is this. In the Bible, we're commanded to love our neighbor. But have you ever considered the fact that by using your vote to support those candidates that best uphold policies that are in alignment with God's word, that is actually a way of loving your neighbor. Uh, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 29, the ancient people of God, and by the way, the context of this passage is that the people of God were under his judgment because they turned their backs on him. And so he's, they, God said, okay, Babylonians are gonna come in and they're gonna rule over you. But then he says to them, as you enter the city, do good, do good. Because if you do good in your city, it will be good for you. So again, one of the ways that we can do good for our city is by supporting those candidates whose policies best align with God's word. So what are those policy issues? Well, there's a number of them. I'll just highlight a few of them. Number one, religious liberty, personal freedoms, the upholding of laws, sanctity, of life, by the way, in reference to sanctity of life, Illuminate is one of a couple churches on the northeast end of the valley that today at 139, we're gonna gather in the parking lot at 1230, we're gonna mark the back of our cars, vote no on Prop 139, you've heard me talk about that a number of times and I'll explain why here in a second. We're gonna mark the back of our cars, vote no on Prop 139, and then we're gonna, we're gonna caravan down uh, the 101 and then back up Scottsdale Road together, meeting at 12.30, leaving at 1.39 p.m. Again, I've mentioned it a number of times. This is, is not a political issue. This actually is a moral issue. Prop 139 takes abortion and legalizes it all the way up through nine months. Again, I've already said it a number of times before, but in the state of Arizona, abortion is legal through 15 weeks. Most Arizonans do not support abortion all the way through nine months. Again, the wording of this proposition is, it's kind of sneaky, it's very broad, encompassing just about anyone you can imagine in the healthcare industry that would provide for abortions. And so we're voting no on Proposition 139. But to use your vote to select candidates whose policies best uphold what the scriptures teach is a way of loving your neighbor. That's why I encourage all Christians everywhere to get out and to vote. If you need some help, Center for Arizona Policy has done an amazing job. If you go to their website, Center for Arizona Policy, they've actually asked the specific candidates here locally questions, and then you can read their responses to gauge how they align with what the scriptures say and with what you believe personally as a Christian who does believe in the truth of God's word. Having said that, if you've got your Bibles, we're in Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna pick up where we left off last week, and I wanna tell you that Ephesians chapter four marks a new beginning in this book. It's an amazing, amazing separation between the first three chapters and the last three chapters. I've, I've always believed that Paul is such a brilliant writer inspired by the Spirit of God. The first three chapters contain theology. It's great theology explaining who God is and who we are in Christ. The last half of the book, the last three chapters, are the so what. Because of who God is and what he's done for us, it ought to manifest itself in, in a life change. Christians are to be different. The first half is doctrine. The second half is application. Once again, Paul is writing from what would seemingly be a restraining place. He's writing from prisoner, from Rome, as a Prisoner, and this is how he begins the second half of the book. He says, he says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. It's really interesting that he doesn't say, Hey, I'm a I'm a Roman prisoner, I'm a prisoner of Rome. He doesn't even mention that. He says, I'm here in confinement under house arrest because it is the will of God. God has this way of taking unwanted circumstances and using them for his greater glory and purposes. 
Certainly from a human perspective, people will look at Paul and say, it's horrible to be you. Paul would write four letters from his confinement. 2,000 years later, we are reading one of those letters. Those letters are contained in your Bible. God has a way of taking unwanted circumstances and, and using them for his greater purposes. He says, I want you to know that I am here in prison because it is the will of God. He continues, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now he moves from theology to practicality. What is some of that theology? Let's back up going to chapter one. He says, we are chosen by God. You've been redeemed by God, bought back with the price. That price is Jesus. The wages of sin is death. Jesus paid your wage. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven, which enables you to enter into a right relationship with the God who created you. You were sealed, that's the guarantee of all that is to come, by the Spirit of God. You're made alive with Christ. He says, formerly you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now you've been made alive in Christ. We are referred to as God's masterpiece reconciled to God, and once we've made reconciliation, once you've made peace with God, that actually frees you up to make peace with others. We are citizens of God's household, recipients of God's wisdom, recipients of his revelation of things to come. We have bold access to God. We are rooted in love, and we are strengthened by the Spirit. Paul says, in light of all these amazing theological realities, so what? What does all of that mean? Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called Christian. You actually have a divine calling on your life. This is the very reason why you are on this planet, for God's greater purposes. The Greek word translated as worth is axios, from which we get our English word axiom. So axiom means to be of equal weight. So picture a pair of balances, right, a pair of scales. And on one of the scales, you have all of the, the rich understandings of who God is and what he's done for you in Christ, okay? All of that richness, all of that doctrine, that theology, that is the first three chapters, is on one set of of scales. Then on the other set of scales is your life. The word walk literally means the course of one's life. So Paul says, apply the axiom. Here you have these weighty things of God. And then you have your life. Make sure they are in balance. You follow? Why do you receive instruction from the scriptures? So that your life would come into conformity with what the scriptures say, that there would be balance. The rest of the book is essentially a detailed explanation of how a Christian walks worthy. He begins in chapter two, with all humility and gentleness with patience, we gotta bear with one another in love, because as we'll see in a second, some of us are kinda hard to get along with, bear with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit that is this bond of peace. Two major characteristics that we'll see in the rest of the book that define the Christian's worthy walk. Number one, unity, and number two, Deep, deep understanding of the holiness of God and the holiness of God's people. In the first 16 verses of chapter four, he digs into unity, so that's where we're gonna be this morning. There are so many things that divide people today. We're in the midst of a political season, and I don't know about your neighborhood, but it's like, you pass by the neighbor's lawn and you see a certain sign and what happens inside you? Ooh, you feel that, don't you? Okay, okay, like whatever side of the line you're on, all right? You walk by and you're kinda like, I didn't know that. 
Guess there won't be any more play dates. <laughs> Worldwide, there are <laughs> thousand year old conflicts currently raging. Economic inequalities, just overall differences in how people approach their lifestyles. All of these divisions lead to alienation. Just last year, just last year, Gallup conducted one of their largest research polls ever on human loneliness. Nearly one in five surveyed reported feeling lonely most of the day. You follow that? One in five people experience a, a deep sense of loneliness. I mean, they literally answered, the quote was, a lot, a lot of loneliness throughout the day. One in five. In 2018, a study by the American Journal of Health Promotion found that individuals who spend over two hours a day on social media are twice as likely to feel lonely as those who spend 30 minutes or less on social media per day. How much time do you think the average American spends on social media? More than two hours. All of this unrest and division leads to alienation, so many factors coming to bear in our own personal lives. It's inescapable. Paul says, the outworking of your understanding of God, church, is manifested primarily through our unity and our holiness. Hmm. Uh, what does that mean? Well, let's, let's be clear. Unity is not uniformity. You know what I'm saying? You, you've seen the Netflix specials on those cults. We don't all wear the same shoes. You know what I'm saying? We don't all have the same haircuts. We don't all look exactly the same. Unity is not uniformity. Uh, if you were to gather some of the greatest Christian thinkers of all time, you'd quickly see this. Uh, you bring Wesley, Augustine, Luther, C.S. Lewis, Elizabeth Elliot. You bring them all together and you start talking theology. They're not all going to completely agree on every topic. However, in essentials, there would be unity. What are the essentials? Well, I'll share a few of them with you. Without the essentials, there, there cannot be unity. The essentials are those things that surround core truth or non-negotiables. I, I put it like this. At Illuminate, we have closed-fisted issues and we have open-handed issues, right? I'll give you some examples. Is Jesus the only way to God? Is that open-handed or closed-fisted? That's closed-fisted, everybody. That's an easy one for us, okay? Jesus is the only way to God. That one's crystal clear. We got that one. That's a core essential, right? Um, is Jesus coming back, closed-fisted or open-handed? No, Jesus is coming back. That's what the scriptures say, all right? When? Uh, let's talk about it. <laughs> it's not quite as clear as some of us would like for it to be, so let's talk about it. We can be open-handed with it. In essentials, there is unity. In non-essentials, there is charity Unity is not complete uniformity, but unity does surround core truths. And what's interesting is that Paul says in order to have unity, not only must you have core truth, but you also must have character. It's no accident that he begins with the character quality of humility. It's essential. With all humility and gentleness, he says in verse 2, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, with all humility and gentleness. Here's what's really radical. Uh, when, when Jesus describes himself as being gentle and lowly, he's using the verbiage of humility. And in the first century AD, humility was a vice, not a virtue. It's like if you said, hey, I'm, I'm humble, you, you would be marginalized. Um, it, the word wasn't even used that often because it wasn't something that people wanted in their lives. And yet Jesus says, I am humble, I am lowly. Matthew chapter 11, verse nine, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart. That's humility. And you will find rest for your soul. So what's really staggering is that Paul 
this is so good in his time because he understands when he says to the Christian community, display humility because there will never be unity unless we're all humble, okay? You gotta be humble. You gotta, when you're less full of yourself, you can be more filled with God and with others. But I know you're all gonna bristle at the idea of being humble, so here, let, let, let's, let me tell you this. It's humility and gentleness, and that word gentleness is defined as strength but under control. You picture like some bodybuilder, right, that's got like muscles upon muscles, carefully holding an infant, okay? That's strength under control. So Paul attaches what he knows is not gonna land well, humility and gentleness, be humble, but you have the strength, you have the strength, but control it. You attach those two things together and you have what's necessary to build unity. Now, Jesus is the example in all things. And you, how many times does Paul lay out a really difficult principle to, to grasp? And then he says, okay, now, let's go here. Jesus is not only our leader, but he's our example in all things. And in Philippians chapter two, he makes the same point. He says, there can be no unity without humility. Now, you're all gonna struggle with that, but let's turn it back to Jesus. Just like last week, we're like, Paul says, hey, you know what? We're called to love each other. Oh, and by the way, Jesus loved you. Jesus loved you. Let's turn it back to Jesus. Philippians chapter two, Paul writes this. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if, if there's any comfort, love brings comfort. If there's any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, church, if any of this stuff is present among you, complete my joy, which is kind of interesting because the reader's like, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, is your joy not complete? Not completely, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. All of these things unify us because there's oneness. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves probably the most difficult verse in the Bible to apply. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, it's not that you should neglect your interests, but also to the interests of others. How does this start? Well, it's an attitude that begins in the mind. Have this mind among yourselves. Okay, I can have the mind, but I need a little more help. Well, you got it. It's yours in Christ Jesus. Now let's talk about Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was in the form of God. He's talking about the pre-incarnate Jesus who was involved in creation. With all the rights and privileges of deity that he had, at one point, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This is what Christians refer to as the incarnation. You like your chili con carne? What is that? Chili with meat. Carne is flesh. Jesus takes on flesh leaves his heavenly place, sets aside his privileges of deity, not considering equality with God something to be grasped, empties himself of those things. How so? By taking the form of a servant, humanity, a man, comes in the flesh. That's humility. It's like, when the king takes off his crown and puts on the poor man's robes. That's humility. And for the purpose of serving others. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. That's all the language of Genesis. The reader's like, in the beginning? Oh, that's Old Testament language when God created the world. Yeah, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, who are we talking about? Drop down to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was with God in the beginning in creation. He puts all of those deities on the shelf comes in the form of man. John says, and we beheld his glory. He lived among us. 
he got tired. He got thirsty. In the moment, in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think it's probably safe to say Jesus had his moments of anxiety when his sweat became as drops of blood, whether you take that figuratively or literally. That's a bad day. Tempted in all ways like we are, but without sin. That's why the author of Hebrews says Jesus is our sympathetic high priest. There's no other, no other faith system like biblical Christianity. You have a savior who is sympathetic to you. Not a, not a savior that is distant and far off and detached, but one who knows what it's like to be tempted in all ways. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The excruciatingly painful process of crucifixion, Jesus was willing to go there. Where does it start? Have this mind. It's Christian, Christian. It's the same mind that was in Jesus as he humbled himself and ended up being the greatest blessing in the world. There's our example. Then he adds this in verse three, and I'm gonna tell you that the wording here is painfully honest, I'm gonna point it out to you. Be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. In other words, what he's saying is, this isn't always easy. And here's the reason why. Some people are really hard to love and you know who you are. Actually, you don't, and that's the problem. <laughs> Actually, it's you and me. I, I said it a few weeks ago. If you're not totally irritated by somebody here at Illuminate, you ain't attending this church. You know what I'm saying? That's why Paul says, it's not always gonna be easy, so you're gonna have to be eager about it. Be eager to promote unity the spirit in the bond that is peace. Consider the author Paul, author Paul. Uh, uh, you know, in his BC days, that is before he met Christ, uh, I would imagine this guy would be characterized as a very difficult individual by his own admission, a Pharisee of Pharisees, which meant he was among the most self-righteous people on the planet. Extremely proud. But then he meets Jesus, and he understands his theology in the example of Jesus, and his heart begins to melt. And this is the man who formerly sought to kill Christians and wanted to have nothing to do with Gentiles. As a Jew, he says, the Gentile is my brother in Christ. Talk about unity. There is nothing like biblical Christianity and the message of Jesus that melts the human heart that allows people to reach across whatever dividing lines there might be for the sake of unity. Now, after saying that there are things that uh, we, um, we have in common, the foundation for our unity is actually God himself. There is one body, verse four, and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope, that is the hope of heaven, that belongs to your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father over all, and through all, and in all, so our unity is actually a manifestation of the tri-unity or trinity of God uh, himself. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 12, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, that's crazy, Jews or Greeks, now, to, now coming together again, we'd never play together, slaves or free. We're gonna get here in a second, it's gonna be an interesting conversation, right? Paul speaks directly to Christian uh, the owner of the house, okay, that is a Christian, and the servant in that house that is also a Christian. And people have said, well, why doesn't Paul just get away with, just do away with all the ills of the relationship between the owner and the servant? Why doesn't Paul just say, I'm abolishing all of those things? He actually doesn't do that. He takes it to the next level. And he says, if the owner is a Christian and the servant is a Christian, guess what? You're in the same family your brothers and sisters in Christ. And with that one statement, he just, he just annihilates and demolishes all of the ills that could present themselves within that relationship. You treat that person as your brother in Christ. You treat that person as your sister in Christ, okay? Worthy of the utmost honor, respect, and dignity. You do not mistreat each other in any way. 
See what, see what biblical Christianity does? And that's why very often in Christian homes back in the day, the servant was treated as a family member with all the rights and privileges of a family member, including a portion of the inheritance. What did that? Christianity. Christianity is what did that. One body, all made to drink of the same spirit. Uh, it's not an easy thing to maintain unity. You can have it one second and lose it the next. So Paul turns from the unity of the church, having the same spirit, same Jesus, same father, to the diversity of the church. In the very next sentence. And even in this diversity, God means it to promote unity. Watch this, verse seven. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So Paul has been using the word all corporately, but now he individualizes it and he uses the word each, making it personal, okay? And he's about to say, each of us, we're not all the same. We don't all have the same gift mix. We don't have the same passions and skills and abilities, okay, in the body of Christ. We're not all exactly the same. But even in our diversity, the purpose is to build each other up as we serve each other with our diverse gifts, but before the, we get into that, he says, once again, Jesus is our example. Therefore, it says, when he, Jesus, ascended on high, he led, host of, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Then you get this parenthetical statement. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that, that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. What's he talking about? He's talking about that time period, it's mentioned in 1 Peter chapter three, between the death of Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection, that three-day period. Have you ever wondered, what did Jesus do during that, that time period? Well, 1 Peter three says, and this is how the early church fathers understood it, that he went to Hades with the grave or Sheol and he proclaimed victory over death. He descended, and then he ascended. But what's really interesting is that this is actually a quote from Psalm 68, and I think herein lies the interpretive issue. In Psalm 68, God is described as going before his people in battle and winning. And as a result, the people give gifts to God. I think what Paul is doing is he's talking about the gifts that God has received, now God is now giving these gifts to his people, and he gave the apostles. That's one gift. And then he gifted his people prophets. Who are these? Well, we talked about them a few weeks ago. These are the men who received the word of God and wrote them down for our instruction. They are the foundation, Paul says. The scriptures are the foundation for everything we do at Illuminate. Then he gave evangelists. The title of evangelist is a very noble one, and I'm gonna tell you right now that in this day and age, these are the people that have tremendous courage because our culture does not like to be told what to do or how to do it. Certainly people do not wanna be told that there's anything wrong with them, and the heart of the gospel is this. There's something wrong with you and me. We need a savior. What do we need to be saved from? Well, a few things an eternal separation from God, that is in and of itself hell. That's why Jesus talked about hell so much. You can't appreciate your salvation fully unless you understand what you've been saved from. That's why Jesus talked a lot about hell. That's one thing. But secondly, you need to be saved from yourself. We make lousy gods. That's not a message everybody wants to hear. The other side of the gospel is you're loved more than you know. You're worse than you think and you're loved more than you know. It takes great courage to step into that space and have those conversations with people. And even though we might not all have the gift of evangelism, we are all commanded to share our faith. Next, God gifts the church with shepherds and teachers. I think these two go together because the Greek word for shepherd is translated as pastor. That's what pastors do, they shepherd the flock. What does the flock need? They need to be uh, led. How do you lead them? Well, you feed them, uh, you guide them, you protect them, you care for them. One of the primary ways you do that is by instructing them in the word of God. I said it 10 million times, I'm up here and I'm like, Jason's opinion doesn't matter. What we wanna get at is the author's original intent 
when he was inspired by the Spirit of God and wrote the words of God because those words are going to bring us life. We teach the scriptures. Three times Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, feed my sheep. This is the work of a shepherd. Lead them well. I think perhaps, I'll, oh yeah, I think perhaps, yeah, I think so. I think probably the greatest need the church has is to understand the scriptures rightly. It's why Paul writes to his younger protege, Timothy, and he says, Timothy, be diligent, work hard, present yourself approved to God. Yeah, in what way? Well, as a workman who need not be ashamed because you can handle accurately the word of God because this is what it means to shepherd the people of God. Now notice the purpose of these gifts, verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. This is discipleship. God has given each one of us different skill set, different passion, different gifts, so that this thing can be built and it can grow and it can be healthy. Again, you've heard me say many times, Illuminate is just like any other church and that we are healthy only to the degree that you all are plugged in and exercising your spiritual gifts and serving those around you. Now, let me be quick to add this. Draw the lens back for a second. He begins by saying, we're after unity here. Unity is one of the hallmarks of, of good theology. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that as, as we, we're, we have served the same Lord, the same Jesus, the same Spirit, all this stuff, and, so, so, and, then, and then all of a sudden, he's unity, 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 and then he says, all of a sudden he says, diversity, diversity. We're not all the same. God has given us different gifts, okay? So how brilliant is God, right? Unity is not uniformity. In the midst of our unity, there is tremendous diversity, but that diversity is meant to be used to build up the church. I need what you have. You need what I have. But if we're not entering into that space where we're using what God has given us to serve one another, we will not be built up. See, that does, look, he tells you, all of this is to equip saints for the work of the ministry. We want a lot of ministry work around this church. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning. So when, when we serve one another, we're actually helping each other mature. Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Chapter six, we're gonna talk about deceitful schemes because there is a power behind the deceit that is Satan himself. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way, grow up in every way into him who is the head into the Christ. One of the reasons why people are stunted spiritually is because they're in isolation from the body of Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. No one gift is any more important than another. If you have a visible upfront gift, God bless you. Use it. If you have a gift that isn't so visible, you are essential. Elsewhere, Paul talks about gifts as being distinct parts of the human body. He's like, some of us are eyes, some of us are ears, right? If the whole body was an eye, what would that be like? That'd be kind of grotesque. If the whole body was an ear, that would be grotesque. We need the diversity, right, so that we can all grow up together and be mature. When you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and you spend time on your face, your hair, there are other parts of your body that you just kind of cover up and you don't think twice about, right? They are no less important, and I'll prove it to you, okay? Anybody here ever been constipated? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are body parts that you're like, oh, I kind of forgot about that, but now I'm thinking about it a lot. You follow? Every part is important. What's your part? If you don't know, we can help you. We have a little class called GPS, Gifts, Passions, and Skills. But, but here's where I would encourage you. This is serve month. This is serve month. 
And one of the great ways the world understands the importance of the church, our unity, the diversity within, is when we go outside of these walls and we serve in our community. You know, it's kind of that idea where, and I've literally been told this, it's like, well, illuminate, yeah, they're okay. Certainly don't, don't agree with everything Jason says, but I'm glad that church is here. I'm glad that church is here. You know, because they're feeding the homeless six days a week. Yeah, I'm glad that church is here. You know, they're, they're stepping into some really difficult and dark places through their partnerships, which you all help support through your generosity, areas of addiction and recovery. Celebrate recovery here on Friday night. You wanna come and meet some really cool people? Stop by. So I don't agree with everything, but you know what? I wish we had more Christians like them. Follow? See, this is how the church is built up, but this is also an attraction to those who are not yet with us because we exist for those who aren't yet here. We want more of them to be more of us, so there's more of us to reach more of them. You got it? Yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah. Stop by the tent. Call the office this week. We'll give you all the details on how you can employ your gifts. Let's pray. Father, once again, good word. We're grateful for revealing who you are, God. Now, the emphasis follows that we would walk worthy of our calling. The outworking of the theology is a changed life. Father, remind us of that. Moment by moment, as Paul says, we take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. That's the maturing process that goes hand in hand with the maturing process we have for each other. And even in this, as we serve one another, we're drawn closer together. I pray that you would continue to strengthen your body here at Illuminate and, and all those that are lifting up the name of Jesus all over the valley and all over the world so that the name of Jesus can be made known and be made famous. That, that's what we want. In the end, we wanna take as many people to heaven with us as possible. I pray that your spirit would just kinda be nudging, be nudging this week, Lord, and that maybe just the first step would happen. All for your glory, we pray. In the name of the one who makes it all possible, his name is Jesus Christ, and God's people said, amen. amen.